Numerous kings succeeded to the throne of Israel between the reign of Saul and the abolition of both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. But none of these kings attained the stature and authority that Solomon gained. Abraham had been promised about a thousand years before Solomon that his seed would inherit the land of Canaan, extending as far north as the Euphrates River. However, this promise was not fully fulfilled until the reign of Solomon. Solomon expanded Israel's territory from the Red Sea in the south to the Euphrates River in the north. He carried on Israel's golden age which had begun under King David. He was king of Israel for 40 years and his reign was one of peace and harmony. Solomon made a promise to God at the start of his reign that he would rule Israel in obedience. If Solomon continued to live righteously before the Lord, he would receive promises of wisdom, wealth, honor, and long life. The assurance was kept. Solomon rose to prominence for his wisdom throughout his lifetime. Great people came from different countries to hear him speak and test comprehension and expertise. And test his comprehension and expertise. There were supposed to be no kings in the history of the world who could compare to Solomon in terms of wealth, which he also accumulated. Israel attained her greatest achievement as a nation under his rule. She had honor, money, power, and respect. However, Israel went bankrupt both temporally and spiritually after Solomon's rule. There was conflict and decay everywhere. Within a year of Solomon's passing, the country was split into two kingdoms, forever changing the path of Israel's history. Solomon fell from God in his final years, but how did this happen? For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, and his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned away from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and give it unto thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give it to one tribe to thy son for David, my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake which I have chosen. 1 Kings chapter 11 verses 4 to 13 Scripture doesn't turn a blind eye to the flaws of its heroes. Its portraits accurately depict all the flaws rather than smoothing out the creases. This ruthless honesty is a powerful indication of its source, the one true God. Christianity is based on the absolute truth of God, and to present half-truths about its characters would be to compromise on this truth. The Old Testament histories are not intended to recount Israel's history or even tell of its triumphs. Rather, they are intended to tell of God's dealings with Israel. This is a very different theme, and it finds its material in both the triumphs and tragedies that result from Israel's obedience and disobedience, respectively. Since God dealt with Solomon when his heart was turned away, it is important to note that God's dealings with Solomon are described in the same candor as his brilliance and wealth. The story of Solomon's reign, according to what is said, paints the perfect picture. Strange idealizing that results in the ideal king being a rebel against Jehovah and wallowing in sensuality. However, we are merely informed of the two events, his transgression and the subsequent divine judgment. The dark story of Solomon's apostasy is told in verses 4 and 8. How bad was it? Did he participate in idolatry himself? Or did he only permit these foreign women's shrines out of 
naive affection for an old sensualist. The more sinister hypothesis seems to be true. His wives could hardly have been said to have turned away his heart, if all he did was wink at or even help their devotion. The phrase, he went after other gods, is frequently used to refer to idolatry. On the other hand, he doesn't seem to have stopped worshipping Jehovah. His heart was not perfect or wholly devoted to the Lord, as is stated in verse 6, that he went not fully after the Lord. He was stuck between two ideas, or more accurately, he was attempting to hold both at once. He desired to worship both Jehovah and these other gods. The silence with which he receives the divine warning of punishment is suspicious, and there is no indication of his repentance. In addition, Ahijah's prophecy to Jeroboam, which occurs after the text threats, treats idolatry as still being practiced in verse 33. Additionally, 2 Kings chapter 23 verse 13 informs us that the shrines he constructed stood until the time of Josiah. Solomon would not have left them standing if he had ever renounced idolatry. He seems to have been an example of a fall from which there was no recovery and an eclipse which persisted. If he had written the book of Ecclesiastes, it might have helped to lessen the gloom of such a conclusion, but almost everyone today doubts that he was the author. The three kings, which were situated on Olivet's southern peak, were directly across from the temple, where the kings offered sacrifices. If he did, there would be such a large crowd of followers. A fall of this magnitude has many lessons. It first demonstrates the negative consequences of giving way to sensory desire. Solomon's unrestrained and monstrous polygamy sapped his masculinity and principles, clouded his clear spirit, dimmed his keen eyes, and transformed his youth of noble aspiration and manhood of great accomplishment into an old age devoid of respect, reverence, and calm. If his intelligence could not keep him in control of himself, it was of little value. A young man who allows his passions to take control of him is less guilty than an aged sensualist. God intends for reasons to override emotions and wants, and for conscience to rule over everything and submit to His will. When the officers are forced below and the mutineers take control of the helm, the ship will undoubtedly capsize. Second, it serves as a reminder that accidents can happen at any point in life. Solomon's ship sank near the end of his journey. It struck inside of the harbor, and not because of a lack of lighthouses. When Solomon was old, that phrase contains the most pitiful warning. He fell after so many years of lofty goals, so many temptations resisted, with such noble habits and kingly manners, after so many prayers and visions. And if he fell, who can be sure he will stand? No amount of time spent in devout meditation and service will completely protect us from the risk of a catastrophic fall. This is the one thing that works, telling God, hold me up and I shall be safe. When a man with a sterling reputation for honor and wisdom spills a lot of dirt on the white page near the end of his life, he rarely comes back. Usually, an elderly apostate becomes a complete apostate. Third we should venture to interpret this as a warning against marriages lacking spiritual and religious fidelity. If a young Christian, man or woman, goes into such a partnership with one who is not a Christian, it is much more likely that, in the end, there will be two unbelievers rather than two believers. We have nothing to do with making judgments about Solomon's final condition. He stands as a sad, enigmatic figure on the pages of history as an exhortation to all young people to be careful that the deterioration of the world does not tarnish the bloom of early religiosity or cause them to become cynically ashamed of the selflessness of their youthful goals. There is no sadder sight than an old man who has become a hard worldly person or a coarse sensualist because his early zeal for goodness and conviction in the super excellency of wisdom have withered. The early years when he was unknown and underprivileged and trusted in wisdom and the God of wisdom were better than the later years. When he has become pampered by worldly success, 
the divine wrath announced is revealed in verses 9 to 13. The closing pair of these two portions is meant to convey the lesson that sin and punishment are directly related. Even if the punishment takes a while to manifest, the divine decision to send it immediately follows the offense. There may be many or few links in the chain connecting turning away from God and losing blessing, but it is riveted on when the wrong is committed. The aggravations of Solomon's offense are laid out so gravely with the voice of an indictment made in heaven that it is difficult to ignore them. He had transgressed against the Lord, who had twice spoken to him, once in a vision when he was young and again after the temple was finished, and had commanded him concerning the sin he had committed. The wealth of God's favor and the simplicity of his rules make this sin more terrible. We should be more resistant to the attacks of temptation if we reflect on God's manifestations to us and for us and on his revealed will. We are not told how the Lord told Solomon this. Perhaps the same prophet who later revealed Jeroboam's fate made this announcement. Nevertheless, regardless of who made it, it appears to have been met with stoic silence and to have had no impact on either change or softening. Like all of God's threats, this one was spoken to avoid being carried out. If Solomon had confessed his sins, Jeroboam would not have been addressed. Sadly, he was far too along to be stopped. We have made clear statements about the worst outcomes of our actions, but some of us ignore them. How odd is it that even if they must reach across the smoke of the abyss to do so, mankind will nonetheless stretch out their hands to reach their sins.